Welcome to Live on Purpose Radio with Dr. Paul Jenkins, where you will hear inspiring stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Feed your mind with a regular dose of positive energy and show up for your life every day on purpose. Living on purpose means that you have a purpose and you do it intentionally. And now, here's your host, Dr. Paul. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Live on Purpose Radio. This is Dr. Paul, the shrink who expands your life, bringing you another episode of Live on Purpose Radio. And I'm thrilled today to have with me here in studio Tiffany Berg. Say hello, Tiffany. Hello. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. We've had a great time even not recording yet. We've just been... Just warming up. Lots of affinity there. Well, Tiffany, you have been working for a decade or so as a success coach, primarily for women. And you've had some remarkable experiences that way, but your life is taking a little bit of a turn in a different direction. And you shared with me before the show that you're working in a chaplaincy program right now through a hospital and working primarily with with end-of-life patients and their families to deal with some fairly heavy stuff Or at least it feels heavy to a lot of people. You know, I spend most of my chaplaincy hours on the ICU floors and in the ER. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting thing to be in that setting where really it seems to be um, where the most significant things come to the surface. And, And it's the most significant stuff because when you're faced with mortality you get to take a really close look at what's important and some stuff just isn't. huh? Well, and I think we get so busy, you know, as you said, going from success coaching to now the ER, Mm -hmm. um, when people are setting their goals, they are setting them from a state of reflection. I think I'd like to do this. I think I'd like to accomplish this or climb this mountain or, and Mm -hmm. when you're sitting in the ER and you're not sure how your child is going to do, over mm-hmm. the next 12 hours, um, those lists become very trivial. Those yeah. success lists. So success coaching to chaplaincy. Tell us about your journey. Well, it's been an interesting one. And certainly understanding the value of chaplaincy and being that support and that listening has nothing to do with fixing And Mm. coaching, success coaching, is all about strategy and um, Mm -hmm. and, and tenacity. And in some ways, chaplaincy is about being still. So there are almost Mm. two different disciplines. And Mm -hmm. um, in 2007, my husband Paul was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And we... We went through an experience with him that didn't fit any of the success coaching models that Mm -mm. I'd learned and was so used to sharing and understanding that chaplaincy was exactly what fit. So now Mm -hmm. I'm learning all about chaplaincy and what that means and what that discipline is. I was thinking as we were preparing for the show today, Tiffany, that being a chaplain... And being a success coach, have some similar principles. And there may be some different strategies that you apply. And the context is very different. But the principles aren't necessarily that different. It has to do with being very clear about what's the most important. Absolutely. Well, and I think the, you know, when you're sitting in the ER and you've had a great tragedy happen, I was at the hospital on Thanksgiving evening, Mm. and um, boy, what a profound time to have these crises happen, these crises happen. But, you know, certain things definitely would be on a a success list, having great relationships. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I just think sometimes when we're in that mode of success coaching, we put certain things as priority um, things 
yeah. as priorities. Stuff Whereas or money stuff, or things. Right. Mm-hmm. Whereas um, in real crisis, those, that stuff just doesn't matter. And, and so that's the biggest difference that I've seen is, is really the priorities that matter. I'm thinking uh, for myself and maybe for a lot of you listeners that as you consider that life and everything you want to accomplish in life has a deadline. And this isn't a game that you get to play indefinitely. There's an end point. And as you near that end point, the context becomes more clear about what's the most important. All that stuff you accumulate, you don't get to take with you to the funeral home, right? Right. And, you know, standing at the cemetery, there's an interesting sense I get. Um, It is a beautiful, reflective place. But as I look around, I realize that no one in that cemetery left at the time they wanted to. Some wanted to leave Mm. earlier. Um, Some, it was far too soon. And so sometimes when we look at that deadline, you know, we, we have to realize it's, it really comes down to relationships. And at any given moment, what is the state of your relationships? Because that will mm-hmm. matter the most. No matter how long or short your life is, that one factor will play the biggest part. So you're observing as you work with these families and from your own experience, because your husband was in that position. You were in that position because you don't get to do this solo. And you're you're noticing that that's what it comes down to, the relationships. Absolutely. And I think I see, you know, when the first thir- 30 to 60 seconds when you walk into a room, you can immediately sense the love in the room or the tension. Mm. And it's so beautiful to see families that have grown these deep nurturing relationships and if there's a crisis they're there for each other if they haven't um, had healthy relationships there is tension that actually adds to the patient's demise Um, Mm. it creates more dis-ease and discomfort and it's so it's an interesting dynamic to see families that either they've been healthy emotionally or unhealthy and there's a big difference in what plays out you know you've got me thinking (laughs) and as I create an image in my own mind what if today what if today were that day for me or for my family are we set are we good to go you know so to speak what is it in your experience, Tiffany, that you have found helps families to create this? What are, what are some of the principles behind having peace when that time comes? And it's not, it's not if. True? True. It's, it's when. It's when and how. I mean, there's some questions about those things, but it comes. And when it hits you unawares or if you don't feel prepared for it, it creates a very different experience than if you are at peace with, with where you are in those relationships. So what makes Absolutely. the difference? What, what have you found? Well, I can tell you in the, in the cases where it's unhealthy, mm-hmm. there isn't, for example, working with a, a young man that had tried to commit suicide and he didn't want his family called. Um, mm. The saddest thing there was that there wasn't grace in his family, that their relationships had been such that there wasn't room to make mistakes. Um, Mm. There wasn't room for forgiveness. Um, Mm -hmm. So definitely in the, in the families and in the relationships that work, there is a great power in that forgiveness and, and just that mutual Mm. support and respect that we all make mistakes we all stand by each other. We forgive each other. It, that's a big component. What you're saying is so basic and so fundamental to human happiness. I hope we don't overlook the power of what you're just, what you're just saying now. 
Well, and, and here's the interesting thing when we're talking about success coaching versus chaplaincy. Um, we may on our list for the day say, you know, on our ideal vision board, you know, mm-hmm. have this Ferrari, this yellow Ferrari. Mm-hmm. And we may think, wow, someday I'm going to arrive at my yellow Ferrari. Um, we may we may not be focusing on forgiveness in our families and we may miss it because it seems so evident and yet it is so huge that if we were to to put that word up there mutual forgiveness or grace put it on your vision board and put that as something that you aspire to because that is the component that will matter in the end Mm -hmm. ultimately it will matter can you know if if a child made a mistake could they call you? Um, would you forgive them? Would you listen? Or if they tried to commit suicide, would they not call? Afraid of your response. Mm. Huge. Wow. You know, forgiveness is probably one of the most powerful concepts that can assist you in a time like that. If you don't have forgiveness going on at the end of life, whether it's your own life or a loved one, if you don't have that forgiveness there, the peace is not going to be there either. Absolutely. Is that your experience with Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And, and really, you know, if you can just have that, and I say just have that, but if, there's, if that is part of the dialogue in your family, you know, we forgive each other, we stand by each other, then if a crisis happens, You've always said the right things. Mm-hmm. You've prepared your children. You've you are in relationships that are healthy that can stand um, even the worst. Mm-hmm. They're strong enough. How would you define forgiveness? Let's pick your brain mm. a little bit on that one, because I think it's a very misunderstood concept. Absolutely, and uh, and and I don't want to mistake that for denial. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, because okay, we can w- yeah we could talk codependency for a while. Well, here. it's not <laughs> forgiveness is not saying that nothing happened, right? Or even that it's okay what happened because right. sometimes people do hurt each other, right? And in families, we do. Yeah, we just do. But I think one of the the factors in that is um, compassion, dignity. Um, you might have uh, someone in your family that chooses a different lifestyle or, you know, there are things that happen along the way that divide families or personalities. Um, Mm -hmm. But if there is grace and dignity towards each other, um, then no matter what happens in a crisis moment, you know your family will be there for you. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that that's probably something, like I said, we, we talk in success coaching all the time about, you know, what is on your vision board? Where do you want to visit in your lifetime? And how will you know when you've arrived? Um, I think that's the hardest thing because forgiveness isn't arriving. It's, it's, a, it's a part of your character. So It's an ongoing process. It's a dynamic process. I really like, I can't even remember who shared this with me originally. I have so many ideas that come from so many great people. I love to brag about my stuff because none of it's mine. But this one is that forgiveness is giving up your demand for a better past. And I I like that one. Whatever has happened has happened. And now you get to choose what you're going to do with it. You might have noticed that the past doesn't even exist really, except in our current thinking about it. So forgiveness is all about changing your current thinking, current thinking about whatever it is that you're holding as a grievance in your heart. And that can bring, can bring real peace and healing. Absolutely. Another one of the, the character traits that I see so, so powerfully in that situation is gratitude. Um, you know, it's uh, just being there on Thanksgiving, um, seeing the families that were hurting that day, and yet seeing those individuals that even in crisis, they were so gracious and grateful for people helping them. 
Mm-hmm. And you just knew they would heal better in their lives because yes. they were so grateful and hopeful. So you've hit on something that I love to think about, but also I challenge my clients on this all the time. There was some research done at Stanford University, Dr. Fred Luskin. He was actually researching forgiveness and the power of forgiveness. He found that gratitude is probably no less than a prerequisite for forgiveness. Is that from his book, Forgive for Forgive Good? Forgive for Good, Fred Luskin. <laughs> I have it in my car. That's so Beautiful. funny. You bring that up. Because it is profound, that state of gratitude is the lens through which you see your experiences. And if you can see them, even the hard things, even um, the losses, with Mm -hmm. a state of gratitude, um, it changes the whole thing. It It changes the power of things. You know, I love the way Wayne Dyer put this too. He said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And that's a powerful application when we're talking about these particular issues. We'll be right back. Thank you for joining me for the Live On Purpose radio podcast. It is truly an honor to be a part of your prosperity team. Please visit the website, drpaul.org, where you will be able to sign up for Empower, a quick, inspiring message that will be sent right to your inbox several times a month. Click on the blog link to share your comments and be part of the discussion. You can also pick up powerful information products and stay in touch with upcoming events, all to assist you in creating and living a life that you love. Share Live On Purpose Radio with someone in your life today, and thanks for listening. This is Kirk Weasler to tell you about MoreBetterBooks.com. MoreBetterBooks.com is where you can find more better books for a more better life. Not only that, let me tell you about some of the very fun and cool select titles on MoreBetterBooks.com. You'll want to get a copy of The Dog Poop Initiative. This best-smelling book could change your life forever. It certainly changed the lives of thousands of Boeing employees, as well as school teachers, parents, leaders across the United States and in Israel and in Germany. And you can get your own copy at morebetterbooks.com. Whoa, that's not all. What about The Cookie Thief? This classic tale told in a rhyming format, fully illustrated with very fun hidden messages. Pick up a copy now today on morebetterbooks.com. Other great titles there, Finding Your Pathway to Mastery, Beyond Illusions, Make It Great. These titles are only available on morebetterbooks.com. Go to morebetterbooks.com today and begin to have a more better life and live that life on purpose. To be what we are and to become what we are capable of becoming is the only end of life. Robert Louis Stevenson Okay, Tiffany, something that you and I share and have in common is a desire to assist people with emotional health. And, and taking care of yourself creates a context in which you can be emotionally healthy, which then makes you available to provide for the needs of others as well. If you're completely consumed in your own stuff, you're not very available. And I know you have some thoughts along those lines. We were talking before the show about setting appropriate boundaries. Sometimes saying no is okay. Talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. You know, they've, they've actually got a scientific word for how emotions affect the cell. It's called mm. psychoneuroimmunology. It's how, mm. how resilient is the cell based on emotions. 
And they've actually found that to people that are emotionally, that have a higher EQ, emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. have more resilient cells. Now, that's not to say that, you know, there can't be disease there undermining that. Yeah, sure. But, but there is a power if we are emotionally well, if we have this forgiveness factor, um, if we are emotionally honest with our boundaries, they have found that we heal better. And there's actually science, you know, scientific proof behind that. And you're not talking about emotional healing. You're talking about physical body functioning. Absolutely. Absolutely. In addition to all of the great things that happen to you emotionally. Right. Well, and we see uh, so many patients that are going through cancer treatment also learning yoga and how this is giving them the life force um, mm -hmm. to, to fight the cancer. And they've actually established that that is true, that if you are working on this, this positive emotional healing, you, your cells will do better. So that's it, right. It, it, it's In fact, I was just thinking of another study. This may have come out of Stanford as well with breast cancer patients. And they found that on the average, they could extend their life expectancy by two years through group supportive meetings. Absolutely. I was going to say therapy, but it was really just kind of supportive gatherings of these women providing support for each other and emotional healing. And that made a difference in their physical health. Absolutely. The sharing, the mutual support, the listening, mm -hmm. it all adds to validating us emotionally um, and, and our cells respond. It's that's powerful. Right. Uh, and so that's why you'll see in a lot more settings, these roles, chaplain, mm -hmm. um, support for the caregiver. They've also found on the negative that, that when there is, is a loss um, of a spouse or a parent uh, or a sibling, that can create um, distress enough in the body that, that there is either post-traumatic stress disorder or that the immune system decreases so mm -hmm. that within six months or a year, there, there can be huge reverses in the caregiver's health. In their health and functioning. Right. So, so we see that emotions do play a real part. And it, and it really would speak to us to look more at, on an ongoing basis, are we being emotionally honest? Uh, oh, you know, yeah. when they talk about dis-ease of the cell, uh, the more we can be in integrity and say, wow, I'm feeling frustrated right now, or I'm feeling mm. sad right now, and just voicing that honesty, uh, that brings more power to ourselves, even just voicing it. Um, now, there's a difference if you go to the extreme of, of complaining and neurosis and codependency, that whole mm -hmm. direction. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think sometimes, especially in our community where we want to be nice, uh, we don't often acknowledge some of the, the negative emotions that are really there uh, that we need help with. And, and this investment that we have in looking right, you know, everything has to appear to be unruffled. And that's just not how life is. You're going to have ups, you're going to have downs. So you're saying that just having some level of genuine, authentic honesty about that, not to the extreme of, of belly aching and whining about your life, but, but acknowledging that, yeah, you... You have times when you're feeling frustrated or upset or angry or sad or feeling a loss or a disappointment. And it's okay to acknowledge that and find an appropriate way to to express that to someone who can Absolutely. support you. Well, and I think that's the key word is appropriate. Um, I think when we are feeling those emotions, part of what we need to, to be able to do to remain healthy is say, gosh, I'm feeling depressed or I'm feeling um, angry, mm -hmm. what can I do in a healthy way to address those emotions as opposed to covering them up or, or masking them or not talking about them? Because when you, like you said, with the, the women going through the, 
the cancer program, Mm -hmm. when we share our honest feelings and we receive feedback because we've shared it in a place where it was received well, we get that support, we heal. Mm -hmm. And I think part of part of what has undermined us as a community at times is we don't want to look like we um, we need help. And and we actually yeah. undermine because we're not being honest. And it's okay to get help. But it's not only just okay, it's essential. We don't get to do this ourselves. And you think about everything that you need and don't already have, it's going to be provided by someone or through someone else. True. And I think as we look at the demographics, we've talked about the demographics of this, this group. You know, we're getting older. Mm-hmm. So many of us at the same time, uh, we all will be caregivers for our parents or we Mm. will be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And in that relationship, the biggest part of that is having healthy boundaries in being able to say what you need and, Mm -hmm. and get what you need as far as support or help or how to help other people, um, people that you love that you might not know how to care for. So what's your feeling about saying no? <laughs> well, I think one of the phrases that I've kind of come up with is um, no means no. N-O means K-N-O-W. So mm. no means no. I know myself. So there are times when I have to say no. Mm. Um, one of the things that I've read recently, just I'll paraphrase, but in Greek mythology, there is the goddess Psyche, and she has mm. to come to know herself. And to come to know herself, she has to refuse four things. The first thing okay. she has to refuse, it's really interesting as a caregiver to look at this from this angle. The first thing she has to refuse is she has to refuse a beggar. The, mm. s- the second thing, she has to refuse a dying man. The third Mm -hmm. thing, she has to refuse a conversation with a group of women that are controlling people's destiny. And I'll get back to that. Okay. The fourth thing is she has to go to the outer darkness and actually refuse her own appetites. So let me recap those. Okay. And how that equates to boundaries. We're... We're always in a place of wanting to help others. That's just our natural draws to help others that are suffering. And often with boundaries, we don't know where to say no. Mm -hmm. In these four things, it kind of can give us examples of when we should say no. The first thing is the beggar. If someone comes to you asking for something, a good uh, litmus test is can they do it for themselves? So I think Mm. sometimes people ask us for things that would require work on their part or sacrifice. And so sometimes we do have to refuse the beggar. If there are things Mm -hmm. that person must do on their own. And so... For their own good. For their own good. And that doesn't mean, you know, never, never help someone that's suffering. That just means... No, right. Let's look at it. Where would we need to refuse a beggar? The second thing is a dying man. You know what? We cannot save people. Even in the medical world, mm. you know what? Every single person will face death, and we can't save them. So we, c- we have to acknowledge that. The third thing, yeah. those women that were conspiring and controlling people's destiny, sometimes we can become small, and so we have to refuse to go there. I'm just going to refuse mm. to get involved in in drama or or um, controlling um, of other people and and circumstances and judgment. Well, maybe even caring a lot about what those other people think. There you go. And what their opinion is about. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> because I think you can get caught up in that. And the last one is um, sometimes we even have to refuse our own appetites, whether that means serving past... Um, we're as comfortable with our own sleep or we really have to, for our own health, refuse certain things, you know, dietary restrictions mm-hmm. that would that would really be impact our health. Um, and we do have to go to that dark place inside ourselves and no one can go with us. So 
part of that is just really doing that inner work that no one can do for us. Well, we all have this private battle with our appetites. And we don't always desire things that are good for us. Have you noticed that too? Well, and we're talking right after Thanksgiving, so amen uh, to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and as we head into the holiday season, and I know that this is a time-delayed podcast, so people could be listening to it in July, but it's it's very common for us to to indulge in things that aren't healthy for us, that aren't good for us, either emotionally, psychologically, or physically. And those are natural appetites. We all have these inclinations, and you can just think about what your favorite one is, and you'll know what we're talking about. There you go. (laughs) Well, and I think there's a lot to be said about really, you know, no means no. When mm. I know myself, I do say no to certain things. I know that that's healthier for me. And in being healthier for you, it also creates a context in which you can be more helpful and supportive and loving toward all those around you. Absolutely. And two, we have more of a reservoir when we are healthy emotionally. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have more of a reservoir to support other people. Absolutely. And that's a biggie because sometimes we are resentful because we have not filled our own buckets Mm -hmm. and we've given too much. So you're talking about some of this palliative care that that you've been involved with and end of life patients and their families, but think about how this applies also to parenting or to a marriage or to those other key relationships in your life where where really the bottom line is, how are your relationships? Not how much money do you have, how many things have you accumulated? Because when you're facing that deadline, there's only a few things that really matter still. Right. And, and part of what we need to look at is we... We don't get to choose that deadline. No. There for is the a most de- part, we <laughs> don't. For the most part. And there's some moral issues with choosing it. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a whole nother conversation. Yeah. <laughs> right. But we also know that nobody gets out of this alive. So we're all going to face it. And we will face that ourselves. We'll face it with our loved ones. Absolutely. So, so Tiffany, we've got just a few minutes left. And I want to make sure people know how to find you. And it's not too hard. You've got a website. I do. I which, do. like mine, is under flux <laughs> and change. And, but it's there. And it it's, is. And there's a lot of resources. You've authored eight books. Correct. Is that correct? The last of which was about talking to kids about cancer. Right. Wow. And uh, folks, if you're in that position, here's somebody that I trust to give you some good advice about that and I've seen the book and I uh, this is a hard thing to talk about but you've taken it on well and because our children were losing their dad to cancer um the nice thing is on my website I do read the book and there are pictures and it's video so even if you don't purchase the book a child could watch it Mm -hmm. and it's it's if cancer were a fish I'd throw it back I'd throw (laughs) it back yeah but you don't always get to throw it this is the fish you got and, That's right. And thank you for being willing to share your personal experience about that. That is a tender, sacred experience, but it's one that's shared by a lot of people, and they're not sure what to do with it. So Absolutely. thank you for that. Thank so you. your website is your name, Tiffany Berg, T-I-F-F-A-N-Y-B-E-R-G.com. Correct. And what else can they find there? Uh, Well, more and more resources will be placed there, especially for caregivers, individuals that are caring for their parents or someone going through cancer. Okay, and there's ways to contact you or get in touch with you. Mm -hmm. You also um, do speaking and things like interviews on Live On Purpose Radio. (laughs) That's right. Well, you've done a lot of TV and radio stuff in the past, too, so... You're comfortable with those kinds of invitations as well. I am. Thank so you. So, folks, I want to recommend to you, Tiffany Berg, if you've got some some things that are going on in your life or people who you know and love, let's get connected with those resources because it's by sharing those with each other that we truly get to support each other. So, Tiffany, as we're wrapping this up today, I want you to just kind of sign off with your, your thoughts. Thank you. Well, it's all about relationships. And uh, how exactly will you live and love? Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Go out there and live on purpose. <laughs>